Welcome back to the TNW Sweat Lodge. I mean the TNW Live Studio. It's uh, pretty warm and muggy here, but we're happy to be here today with Jason Silva. We just did a keynote on our biggest 360 degree stage. Jason, how was it? It was awesome, actually. It was uh, very exciting for me because I love Amsterdam. I love the Dutch people, I love your bike culture, and I love that you guys are a place that celebrates innovation and free thinking. So the keynote, being surrounded by that good vibe and all that love was great. And I got to really pour my heart out and talk about how we can leverage these disruptions and these innovations that we're sort of living through today yeah, maybe to, you can to tell make this audience, a better world, you know? Maybe you can tell our audience a bit kind of what, 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 what you're, what you're, what you're yeah, talking so, about. Yeah, so, your you know, we're... we're you know, this is a technology conference, a tech and culture conference, um, and people come here thinking, how can I be innovative in my company, or how can I create the next startup that makes that can scale and make an impact on the world? So, so innovation moves very fast, and people are excited to leverage the speed of innovation to become entrepreneurs and, and think big, and that's that's all good. Um, I'm interested in the larger narrative, the bird's eye view of what these disruptions that we're living through today ultimately mean. Um, not because I don't think it's important to get excited about creating the next startup, yes, but I want people to aim higher and I want people to give themselves permission to think, to think cosmologically, like <laughs> what does a technology creating species like us mean in the grand scheme of things? Our capacity to manifest our consciousness in the world in the form of concretized tools and then use those tools to redefine our limits and boundaries is is an astounding narrative for me. Right, right. I'm a course. big fan of Ray Kurzweil. The singularity idea is, uh, for me, like a, it's almost like an aesthetic orgasm to hold in mind. <laughs> a cognitive you, you orgasm. Like, you really like these kind of, these kind of sex metaphors, yeah, don't you? Yeah, I do, yeah. I was once told I was addicted to cognitive ecstasy. Wow. And so that's the pleasure of understanding, the, so ple the pleasure of realization, you know. And so, yeah, I try, I try to provide mythic narratives for our techno age. All right. Okay, so uh, you just said that people in Amsterdam are free thinkers and uh, that we should look, uh, that we should have a cosmological perspective. Yeah. Um, um, with our editorial team, we came up with a few questions okay. that uh, might embody this, um, and I'd like to ask them to you. So, just think freely, okay? okay? Yeah. Do you prefer puppies or rainbows? Uh, I gotta say puppies. Puppies. Interesting. Yeah. If you were a piece of fruit, yeah. what fruit would you be? Uh, <laughs> hmm. Let's go with watermelon today, because watermelon would taste great on a hot day like this. Uh-huh. A refreshing fruit. Yes. Right. With the right, right amount right. of crunch and texture. What food should not exist? What food should not exist? For me, it's blue cheese. Just anything Highly fungus. processed foods that cause inflammation. Like... I don't know. I'm not a nutritionist, but I hear a lot about like processed carbohydrates and how terrible they are for you. So moving on, what number is the worst number? What number is the worst number? Mm. Bad numbers. Shit, man. I don't know if if there's any bad number to be honest. Mathematics can explain the universe, so numbers are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Even pi. It's sublime in its complexity. How about mm. that? Okay. How about no? <laughs> Would you rather be a salmon or a tree? Uh, probably a salmon, so I can swim upstream. Hmm. You know that metaphor, yeah, salmon yeah, yeah. swimming That's upstream. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Hey, most most people in the editorial office wanted to be a tree because it would give you a, a longer term perspective to life. Well, that's that's very true. I guess if I could be a giant redwood tree, right, live for thousands of years, that'd be awesome, right? Yeah. Um, this is in connection to an interview you did once with the Atlantic. What abstract concept would you like to have sex with? <laughs> <laughs> What abstract concept would I like to have sex with? Mm. There's a right answer and a wrong answer, by the way. No, I would like to have sex with awe. The concept of awe is an wrong, experience that stretches wrong your answer. mind. You no? wanted to have sex with ideas. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, the idea of awe is more singular. I used to be polyamorous. <laughs> I'm like, I want to fuck all these ideas. Right now, I want to have sex with awe. Okay, here's a deep one. 
if you could look at the most beautiful thing in the world but go blind afterwards wow. would you do it hmm wow hmm you know in a way that's kind of like life is it isn't it right like you get to live and breathe and gasp and wonder and learn and ejaculate but then you have to die so it's kind of kind of life is already a a messed up proposition you know we've committed no crime yet we are afflicted with a death sentence so if i could look at something that's the most beautiful thing on the planet but go blind afterwards i suppose if that was the only choice i'd rather look than not look because we're all going to go blind eventually just like we're all going to die but i say like let's actually change the rules of the game you know the concept of finite versus infinite games so it's this wonderful book that says the finite games are played to win or lose mm -hmm. but infinite games are played to keep the game going so i want to play the infinite game both with our capacity to look at beautiful things and with our lifespans like everything is hackable space everything That's can be changed actually a really good answer life because it it kind of encompasses it all yeah what's in your pockets i got my uh, iphone my apple earbuds my wallet and the keys to the apartment nothing strange no are humans apish men or manish apes uh manish apes that was you were very very convinced yeah yeah i mean i think that uh that we are like the apes from 2001 a space odyssey <laughs> when they finally figured out to use tools and the minute in cosmological time scales the minute we figured out how to use that tool we threw it up in the air it became a spaceship man yeah i think good answer again I was expect. Uh, you know, I, I you know, I liked these questions, but you're, I like your answers a lot well, as well. Well, thank you. They really, I mean, they really, they're, 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 they have perspective. Thank you. Um, so you're you're very much a techno optimist. Yeah, I, I choose to be. Say, right, you choose to be. Yeah, I think it's a choice that we I make. I mean, even if that's a choice, do you think there are things that that technology technology could bring that might go too far things that we shouldn't want that we might be able to yes unintended consequences are a very real thing human cultures full of anecdotes you could start with fire mm -hmm. there's a great book called cooking made us human and, really. and the key idea in that book is that when we domesticated fire mm -hmm. and we were able to cook food for the first time uh, that was essentially a piece of technology that acted as a prosthetic and external stomach that pre-digested our food right. and made the meals more bioavailable, more nutrients could be extracted per meal, which means we stayed full for longer mm -hmm. and there was enough free time that we could create other things that before cooking we spent most of our waking hours chewing, right. chewing raw food. So without cooking that technology, we wouldn't be human. So I've heard a but, similar thing. Uh, but fire can also burn the village. Right. Fire was also the first weapon of destruction, of mass destruction. So all technologies are like that. It's called du double-edged sword. The alphabet. Beer. This knowledge. There was, a, there was a similar theory okay. about beer as well. Well, there you go. So actually, so uh, I think the theory was that it would enable us to have, you know, more. Um, fluid conversations with each other or it would at least bring things up in people that weren't there before there you go but it can also ruin lives huh no doubt food can nourish us or make us have diabetes so one more um, you're very much in so you have a very so solid belief in the singularity and that it will bring us bliss but what I was wondering so you know if we, if we become creatures that you know might extend our lifespan until forever or that that we get the possibility to know everything won't that make us all very the same and very bland at the same time won't you kind of lose the diversity of maybe the fear of death or the limitedness of our of our of our knowledge or our uh, capacity of of, of of abstract thought and I mean I appreciate that question and, and I think it given that we've had no other alternative the prospect of death haunts the human animal so vividly that if we hadn't come up with uh, interpretations that ennoble death we wouldn't have been able to live peacefully and freely so mm -hmm. the concept that death is somehow beautiful and necessary um, makes sense but given the prospect of more life 
I'm sure that you ask the average person who's getting older and their knees don't work because of arthritis and their mind is starting to fail. It's like, how'd you like 50 more years of health span? I'm sure they'd sign up for it in a second, even if when they were young, they were like, oh yeah, I'm not afraid of death. Or, I, I don't know. I, I think I think mortality is a heavy burden for a, a self-reflecting animal. Right. Um, the but concept of the singularity is more metaphorical than anything else right now. Mm -hmm. Very much the way theoretical physicists discuss theoretical physicists discuss what happens when you go through a black hole. Mm -hmm. It's a singularity, which means the laws of the universe that we know of no longer apply. So that's a metaphor to describe where we're heading. It's not, it's not saying, oh, we're going to live forever for sure, or we're going to upload our brains to computers for sure. No, I, I don't know what that event horizon looks like. That's the whole point. It's an event horizon. You, you can't see beyond it. But I think that if we, that we can fashion scenarios, we can fathom scenarios that are almost beyond comprehension right. and they're feasible. No less so than if I was to show our ancestors an iPhone and said, this is a mirror, you rub this magic mirror and all <laughs> the world's knowledge and information will go through the air invisibly, through bodies and buildings or whatever, and it'll go into here when prompted in real time. So there are ways of describing the things we take for granted that force us to look upon them as the astonishment engineering mir astonishing engineering miracles that they are. Right. And I think when we do that, we realize we've already created the impossible. So what's stopping us from continuing to do so? Yeah, but I think okay. So there's I think there's 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 one thing of course in you know the finite possibilities of the technology that we've created and kind of an all-encompassing event of converging all knowledge in the universe. Well, know? that's one interpretation of the singularity. But Kevin Kelly says we've had other singularities in the past. He says the emergence of language was a singularity. He says if you draw a line in the sand and you had humans or the hominids before language and the hominids after language, the hominids before language, the world after language was unimaginable to those on the previous side of that line. Right. He says language is a tool that reveals to the mind what the mind thinks. That without language, we can't imagine, essentially. And he says that that was a singularity as game-changing as the one that the techno-optimists speak about. So looked upon that way, gives us a little perspective like oh this has happened before game changing epochal changing events yeah of course so uh, i asked you a few questions is there is there a question that you uh or not 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 only me but maybe interviewers in general that you wish they would ask you that i wish people would ask me yeah hmm. i don't know i mean i think yeah, I think it would be interesting when people say, like, you know, like, you talk about the singularity and human beings potentially, like, living indefinitely and, like, people are quick to say they don't want to live forever, but they never actually ask me, why would you sign up for living forever? Why my, would you and, sign up And my for answer forever? would be because I want to drink the wine of centuries unborn, <laughs> in the words of Robert Edinger. I, I, I want to have a front row seat to the greatest show of all time. I want to see what happens when we discover how to interstellar travel. I oh, want to see man. what happens when we create virtual reality environments that are indistinguishable from this world. I want to see what happens when we augment ourselves with hackable gradients of bliss that we... <laughs> I mean, I just, I, just, I just don't want to miss out. My, my mind is hungry to, to witness and to learn and to appreciate and I just, just want more time. You know? Same, my dude. And, uh, awesome. Luckily, we still have some time to enjoy all of this. Thank you very much, Jason, Thank for you, joining buddy. us here. Un Thank placer. you very much for joining us. Un placer también. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here as well. We're going to keep going with interviews after this. Uh, Yoni Asia from eToro, interviewed by our own hard fork editor, Dimitar Mix Mihov. Thank you for joining us.